the U.S. instantly undermined it. Uh, within a few weeks, uh, President Bush had exempted U.S. firms from the embargo. So the embargo was fine, but U.S. firms were not going to participate. Uh, the U.S. maintained connections with the high military officers, kept training them, uh, kept uh, relationships with them, was, had them on their you know, biggest killers on the payroll. We don't know the details of this. The reason we don't know the details is that when U.S. troops were finally sent in, uh, they stole all the documents uh, and are refusing to release them or to give them back to the government of Haiti. Uh, there are now still 160,000 pages of documents about terror, torture, relations with the U.S. Uh, that the U.S. simply refuses to release. Uh, Human Rights Watch, which has seen some of them, uh, says that they're being withheld because they would have embarrassing revelations about U.S. relations with the terror and torture. Since they're not available, I can't guess, so you make your own guess. Uh, but the connections are clear, as is the training and so on. Uh, furthermore, the uh, uh, embargo went, uh, undermining the embargo went far beyond exempting U.S. firms. When Clinton came in, in fact, the, um, uh, the um, embargo was further undermined. So U.S. trade with Haiti went up under Clinton during the period of the terror. But more strikingly, uh, both the Bush and the Clinton administrations secretly authorized the Texco Oil Corporation to uh, ship oil to the military junta. Now, oil is the centerpiece of any embargo. You know, no society is going to run if it doesn't have energy. Uh, and they're running on oil. Uh, the, uh, everyone in Haiti could see that oil was coming in, you know, like the rich families were building big oil farms and that sort of thing. Uh, but theoretically, it wasn't coming in. The CIA was testifying for con to Congress that it had been cut off. It was plainly coming in. Uh, and at, as the, the, in fact, the day before the U.S. troops landed, uh, it was revealed, a major story on Associated Press, a uh, major leak from the Justice Department that both the Bush and the Clinton administrations had in fact informed the Texco oil company that shipments of oil would be illegal, but that they would, wouldn't do anything about it. So in other words, go ahead. So oil went in. Uh, in fact, there was no embargo. Uh, after the population had been subjected to three years of terror and torture in the expectation that the popular civil society would be wiped out, or intimidated at least, uh, U.S. troops did go in to restore democracy. Uh, what they restored was the uh, policies of, of the candidate who had been lost, who had lost the election in 1990. Uh, our President Aristide was allowed to return, uh, but on condition, explicit condition, uh, that he accept an economic, a social and economic program written in Washington, uh, which the core element of which was that uh, uh, the resources of the reconstituted government would have to be directed primarily to civil society, particularly private, the private sector, both native and foreign. So that, spell that out. The private sector, native, means the rich folk up in the hills who were supporting the military coup. They get the resources and, of course, investors in the United States. So investors in New York are Haitian civil society, but not the peasants in the hills or the people in the slums of Port-au-Prince. They're not Haitian civil society. Uh, and that's the policy, and that's what's been imposed. Uh, if you look at the economic, in fact, that is the program of the, of the U.S. candidate in 1990 who lost. This is being offered, remember, as the great victory for democracy uh, and markets, which I'll come to. These programs are very carefully, in fact, again, it's not particularly a secret, like Strobe Talbot, the State Department uh, representative, when he testified to Congress, Congress was concerned that the U.S. might lose control of Haiti, you know, after troops withdraw and so on. He said, no, we, no, we will not lose control. We'll still be able to control Haiti through U.S. aid and the private sector. So don't worry about it. It's under control, democracy. Uh, the economic policies are a are picking up again from what they were in the 80s. Uh, Haiti had been subjected to very strict, um, what are called neoliberal policies, you know, Washington consensus policies in the 1980, uh, U.S. 80s, uh, as before, in fact. Uh, USAID, uh, the U.S. had declared that uh, these policies were going to be 
you know, create an economic miracle that uh, Haiti was going to become the Taiwan of the Caribbean. That's what they predicted, uh, knowing perfectly well that Taiwan had followed a radically different course. They couldn't have failed to know that. Uh, but Haiti had all the proper solutions, you know, open up your markets, cut traffic, uh, uh, tariffs, uh, privatize, uh, you know, get rid of the state, all these good things. Uh, and they did. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, there was, uh, it was economically successful for civil society uh, in the U.S. sense, that is, the private sector, both native and foreign. On the other hand, wages uh, declined about 50 percent, uh, malnutrition increased, uh, you know, suffering increased, and so on. That was, and Haiti remained Haiti, not Taiwan, in fact, became more so. Well, now there's been an interlude. The policies are being picked up again. Uh, U.S. There's plenty of aid going in, but very carefully directed. Uh, so uh, about for the overwhelming majority of the population, uh, their livelihood depends on agriculture and handicrafts. Nothing is going to that. There's no aid for those things. Uh, aid is going to the uh, export sector. Uh, the assembly plants, kind of maquilas, you know, the foreign-owned assembly plants, uh, where they pay uh, ridiculous wages, I mean, indescribably low wages, have horrendous working conditions, mostly women, uh, so they get subsubsidies, uh, the agri the, uh, as does the agro-export sector, which is mostly plantations and so on, but not the sector in which the people work. They don't get any subsidies. Uh, so there's cheap um, subsidized electricity, say, for agro-export and industry, but not for, not for the population. They don't get it because that would be uh, price control, and we're opposed to that in principle, at least for poor people. Uh, the, um, uh, before these reforms began, uh, Haiti was producing virtually all of its rice domestically. It's the main subsistence food, uh, with, and that has a lot of uh, interaction with the rest of the economy. So rice production means processing and you know commerce and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, so that was a core part of the economy. By now, after the reforms, the neoliberal reforms, it's down to 50 percent and declining, uh, with the obvious effects on the rest of the economy. Uh, the Haitian rice producers are supposed to open themselves up to foreign competition. That's kind of good for you because you know it leads to efficiency and the market and all that sort of thing. But there's a little footnote there. Uh, they're opening themselves up to competition with highly subsidized U.S. rice producers uh, whose subsidies, in fact, went up sharply under the Reagan years as part of the radical attack on markets uh, during the Reagan years, uh, to the point where by 1987, uh, U.S. rice producers were getting about 40 percent of their income just from government subsidies. And Haitian peasants are supposed to compete with them because the market is such a wonderful thing and good for you and so on and so forth. Well, remember, I, I didn't pick this example. This is the example that's chosen to be the prize example of the victory of markets and democracy. And in fact, it tells you a lot. It tells you a lot about markets. Uh, market discipline is for poor people, uh, not for rich people. You know, they need the protection of the nanny state and get it. Uh, the uh, uh, democracy is okay as long as the, but it's not, it's not assessed by process. It's assessed, assessed by outcome. So it comes out the, the way we want, leaving top-down societies with the power structure intact, then it's okay. But if it comes out the wrong way, like if the wrong people happen to organize and develop their own policies and programs, then no good. Then you have one or another method to get rid of it. Well, I think that's what uh, we really find when we look at the examples that were chosen, uh, and they're revealing. Uh, let's look a little further at democracy. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a long tradition of American democracy, and it's worth remembering what it was. Uh, the United States is, is the country to look at if you want to understand what modern industrial democracy means. It has, it is, I th it's fair to call it the most free country in the world, the most democratic country in the world. It has the most stable, long-standing democratic institutions. They go way back. They've been resilient and so on. So it's about as good a model of the ideal case, if you like, of uh, capitalist industrial democracy, and therefore worth studying quite carefully. I mean, quite, a, 
apart from the fact that we happen to live in it, so we're interested, and it's by far the most powerful country in the world, so it matters a lot what, what it's like. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting history. Uh, you should study about it, in my view, in junior high school, but at least in uh, you know graduate school political science courses, but it's not really much study. Uh, the place to look at the nature of American democracy, the obvious place to look, is in the Constitutional Convention, the debates on the Constitutional Convention, which laid out the framework of what became American democracy, and they're interesting. Uh, they're not much read. What people usually read is the Federalist Papers. I'm sure you've read those. But the Federalist Papers are a misleading source. The Federalist Papers were propaganda, remember. Uh, they were written in order to convince uh, the public, who didn't like what was happening much, to convince them to accept the new constitutional system. So when you read the Federalist Papers, you're reading a kind of a watered-down version, a prettified version of the thinking that was going on. In the, con in the debates on the Constitutional Convention, it's much clearer, uh, and they're interesting. The main framer, as you know, was James Madison, who was uh, at the sort of libertarian end and a very intelligent uh, and lucid uh, uh, analyst and exponent of his views, and his views largely prevailed. I mean, there was very little opposition to them at the end. Uh, he was quite clear on what he was doing. Uh, the model that they were, everyone had in mind, of course, is England. That was the most democratic existing society of the day, so they were sort of, mo and the one, you know, their mother country. Uh, so they were mo they're asking, well, you know, what about the British parliamentary system? And there were debates about whether to accept it or modify it or whatever. Uh, Madison pointed out that uh, the British system would have problems if they tra uh, transferred it over here. Uh, and that is because the United States, they did want to make it, a, he did, he and other, the other founding fathers, as they're called, did want to make it a more participatory and democratic society. But he said a democratic society has a serious flaw. The flaw is that in a democratic society, the people can participate. And he said, suppose what would suppose, he said, suppose this were to take place in England. I suppose, for example, in England, that they really allowed people to vote, which they didn't. He said, well, the first thing people would do would be to uh, call for what we nowadays call agrarian reform. That is, they would call for changes in the land laws, which would grant more people access to the highly privatized and centralized land system. And that, you know, land was a crucial part of the economy then. And he says, well, we obviously can't accept that. You know, we don't want to have any system that will allow people to participate and infringe on the rights of private property and wealth. Uh, so therefore, we have to be careful not to allow a democratic system in which things really function democratically. We have to make design a system in which power is in the hands of uh, uh, the wealth of the nation, I'm quoting, the more capable set of men, uh, those who uh, are sympathetic with the rights of property. Okay, they must have the power, and the rest must be dispersed and factionalized in such a way that they don't really interfere uh, with the rights of power. Uh, actually, Madison, who was no fool, uh, recognized that this problem was going to become greater as time went on, as he put it, uh, if I can read my own notes, uh, he said there's going to be an increase in the proportion of the population that labors under all the hardships of life and secretly sighs for a more equal distribution of its blessings. Okay, there's going to be an increase in that, and if those people really have an ability to participate, they're going to do things which will infringe on the right of private power and, and private property and the wealthy, and therefore we have to design the system so that doesn't happen. And indeed, the system was designed so that that wouldn't happen. That was the role of the Senate, was to represent the wealth of the nation and the role of the separation of powers, and so on and so forth. Uh, how well it functioned, you can argue. It's an interesting question. But uh, it's worth noticing that this idea about the nature of uh, democracy has a long, this, this problem in the nature of democracy, you know, that namely if people can vote, they're going to vote in their own interests and uh, infringe on the rights of private power and wealth. That, goes, that insight goes way back. It goes back to the origins of political theory. Uh, so you read the first major book on political theory in something like our sense, Aristotle's Politics. Uh, that's a core question of Aristotle's Politics. 
Aristotle distinguishes tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy, and there's a long, elaborate discussion of each, and favors democracy. He didn't think it was perfect, but he favored democracy as the best system. Uh, for him, a democracy meant, it was very straightforward, it meant uh, a community of equals, uh, or to be precise, free men who are equals, and that phrase, free men, is rather <laughs> crucial, but put that aside for a moment. A community of free men who are equal and participatory. Uh, and uh, if, unless it's equal, and they can't be seriously participatory, uh, he noticed the same problem that Madison did, he, exactly the same problem. He said, suppose that you did have a democracy where everyone participated, but you had radical inequality, so concentration of wealth. He said, well, then the poorer part of the population, which is the majority, uh, will use their voting power uh, to, for their own interests, uh, to advance their own interests, instead of the common good of all. Okay. And the goal of a democracy for Aristotle was to advance the common good of all. But if you had inequality, radical inequality, well, yeah, the majority of the population would vote for their own interests, which would not be the common good of all. So therefore, he had to do something about that. It's the same problem that, that Madison faced, you know, exactly the same problem, uh, but they reached opposite conclusions. Uh, Madison's conclusion was that we should reduce democracy. Uh, so that you don't get the threat from the population. Aristotle's was the opposite. You should reduce inequality. Uh, so therefore the problem won't arise. And it'll be, a, you could have a real participatory democratic system. So uh, Aristotle called for what we today would call a welfare state. Uh, he said that a democracy must be based on use of public revenues to ensure lasting prosperity for everyone. Uh, welfare state, in other words. Uh, and then he describes in some detail how you could proceed to do that in Athens. We'll do it differently here, but the same kinds of questions. Uh, and then if everyone had moderate but sufficient income, you wouldn't have this problem that both he and Madison faced. But notice that their choices were radically different. One choice was to aim for equality and participation in democracy. The other, the one on which our country was founded, was to reduce the threat of democracy maintain the inequality uh, and uh, ensure that power remains in uh, the Senate, you know, the capable class of men, the wealthy part of the, you know, the wealthy part of the society. That's now internationalized. So this huge financial capital that's flowing around the world is sometimes called by international economists a virtual Senate, meaning it has the power to ensure if you really liberalize capital, to ensure that no country will be able to undertake social policies that strike at the interests of the wealthy. Because if any country moves in that direction, the capital quickly flows out of it and the country goes down to two. So it's a virtual Senate, you know, kind of a generalization of Madison's Senate. Uh, and the opposite of the Aristotelian conception of democracy is necessarily based on a welfare state and equality. Uh, to go back to that word free men, uh, a democracy for Aristotle meant men, you know, not women, uh, and free, not slaves, you know, or aliens. So it's a subpart of the population, but it's a little hard to dump on Aristotle for that since given that those questions weren't even addressed and badly addressed until this century, you know, and still are far from addressed. Uh, but that's a significant qualification. But the principles are there, and they come right up to the present. Uh, it's also been understood, and uh, by now it's, and this, this battle, sort of struggle up and back between the two conceptions of democracy is a large part of modern history, major theme of modern history, uh, runs right through the 19th century. Uh, it's hard to remember now but in the 19th century, which was a rather anarchic period uh, in the United States, uh, it was uh, quite generally assumed that you not only had to have an equal and participatory society, but you couldn't, but that even wage labor was uh, a, an intolerable infringement on human rights. Now, that wasn't a radical position. That was the slogan of the Republican Party, for example. Uh, you could read it in the New York Times editorials in 19, 1870. It was the slogan under which uh, many northern workers fought the uh, Civil War. It was Abraham Lincoln's you know, position. Uh, 
wage labor is not very different from chattel slavery uh, uh, because it's a, it's a fundamental infringement on rights. Uh, it was the major theme of the working class press, which was quite lively around this area, run by you know, women from the farms and artisans and so on. Their position was, look, if you have a democracy, the people who work in the mills have to own them. Uh, and you have to move towards real participation and direct control and so on. And that remained major themes of perfectly mainstream U.S. thinking uh, right up until the corporatization of America about a hundred years ago when corporations developed collectivist legal institutions, as they were called, which got enormous rights, you know, the rights of persons, but in fact well beyond persons because they're immortal and uh, huge and comparison with persons. Uh, that was sharply attacked by conservatives, a breed that doesn't exist anymore, but did exist a century ago, uh, people who really believed in classical liberal doctrines. Uh, they recognized that corporations were themselves a major attack on markets, uh, and that uh, um, also an attack on the natural rights doctrines on which you know, conceptions of human rights and liberty were developed. That was a big change. Uh, and it's, again, not graven in stone. These were decisions. Well, uh, I haven't really even started what I want to talk about, which is how all this <laughs> looks in the modern world, and I'll stop. But let me just say that none of this is changing. It's all going on right today. You know? So you take today's headlines, you find all of this stuff happening. Uh, so take, say, the, let's take, say, the debate over fast track, you know, recent debate. Uh, what was the fast track debate about? Well, the way it was presented was as if it was a debate over trade. But that can't be right. You know? I mean, it wasn't, the fast track legislation was not about trade. It was about who participates in deciding what kind of trade relations to make. It was about democracy. Fast track means no participation. Right? I mean, you can, it's perfectly consistent to be opposed to fast track and to be in favor of free trade. Right? In fact, it's perfectly consistent. In fact, that's not very different from the actual position of the opponents of fast track, although you wouldn't know that from the newspapers. So the labor movement, which is continually denounced, you know, because of its uh, opposition to trade and, you know, muscle-bound and crude, unenlightened tactics and all this kind of stuff, nationalistic, they actually have a position on trade. You wouldn't know it because it was suppressed, totally suppressed during the NAFTA debate and is still suppressed. But their position is that international trade is a very good thing. We ought to have it. We ought to have more of it. But it shouldn't solely be based on investor rights. It should be the, what are called free trade agreements are really investor rights agreements. And the position of labor is, well, there's something beyond investors. There's people, for example. Uh, there's working people. There's communities. There's the environment, meaning future generations and so on. Now, they also should have a trade agreements should be concerned with their rights, not just with investor rights. Uh, the reason for the opposition to fast track was, well, that's a way of avoiding all these things and ensuring that it's just going to be investor rights. Because if it's fast track, no participation, uh, just the more capable set of men deciding on their own without anybody bothering them, yeah, sure, it'll be investor rights, uh, like NAFTA, which is not a free trade agreement. NAFTA is highly protectionist in many respects, and it's an investor rights agreement. Uh, that was the issue on, at Fast Track. You wouldn't know that looking at the discussion. But if you just think through the logic, it's kind of obvious. I mean, Fast Track in itself has nothing to do with trade. It has to do with decisions, right? It has to do with democracy. And the question is, should the population have some knowledge of what's going to hit them and some voice in determining it? Or should it be done behind their backs by the more capable set of men, the wealth of the nation? will do it in their interests. That was the issue over fast track. And strikingly, if you looked at the discussion, you couldn't see that said, although it's not a deep point. I mean, it's like a superficially obvious point. Uh, let's proceed. The crucial issue behind fast track, it's a fair speculation, since this is, there's no discussion about this, so you can only speculate. But I think a very fair speculation is that the issue behind fast track was not whether Chile should be brought into NAFTA. Nobody cared much about that, including the Chileans. Uh, what they did care about was something else, which was unmentioned, and that's the multilateral agreement on investments. Now, that's no joke. 
Uh, there is a big investment treaty going on in secret, crucially, it better go on in secret, uh, because if people find out about it, they are not going to like it, you know. So it's going on in secret at the OECD, you know, Organization of the Rich Countries and the World Trade Organization. Uh, it's been going on for about two years now, uh, being negotiated. At the World Trade Organization, it's going to be blocked, probably. And the reason it's going to be blocked is that the third world countries are, have a voice, and they're not going to let it go through, it looks. Uh, India and Malaysia, particularly, have been blocking it at the World Trade Organization. But at the OECD, there's not going to be anything much that will block it. I mean, there may be reservations here and there, but mostly the rich countries are in favor of it, uh, because what it is is a super investor rights agreement. It gives investors rights that you can't imagine. Uh, for example, it would give investors, foreign investors or U.S. investors, uh, the right to, say, invest, say, in this neighborhood uh, without any concern for uh, marketing restrictions, like are they selling hazardous goods or uh, where they put the factory, is it going to help deprived neighborhoods, are there going to be women participating, uh, you know, any, anything, just about anything you can think of. Any condition that a community or a country might want to institute uh, to determine how investment takes place, any social, environmental, health, other condition is ruled out. Uh, investors have rights to move assets freely, do what they want, unaccountably, and so on. Uh, furthermore, they have, uh, they're going to be granted legal rights that they don't have now, the right to sue uh, in, ca uh, in case they decide that something is an expropriation, that is an infringement on the rights granted under this treaty. Uh, on the other hand, so they can sue, corporations can sue governments, national governments, local governments, um, at any level, but nobody can sue corporations. That's a crucial part of this agreement. It's one-sided. Uh, the suits don't go to the courts. Uh, they go to secret panels, uh, arbitration panels made up by the very same people, you know, bankers, uh, investors, and so on. They make some decision in secret, and that's how they decide uh, whether someone is infringing on the rights of investors, let's say, by imposing restrictions on, I don't know, marketing cigarettes to children or whatever comes along next. Uh, okay, that's, that's the multilateral agreement on investments. Well, that's working through in secret. Of course, it's not technically secret, like, you know, you can find out about it if you really work. Uh, and there are protest meetings about it and so on. But it's been kept out of the mainstream. And it's very likely that that's what lies behind fast track. Uh, the OECD is aiming to have this agreement reached by May 1998. Uh, and if it goes through in secret, there won't be any protest about it. It'll be instituted, and it'll have become, in effect, a treaty. Uh, a treaty means uh, it's, it's very hard to get out of a treaty. That's the point of it. You sort of lock policy into treaty arrangements, then it becomes you know, harder to, for small countries, it's hopeless. They're stuck with it. Uh, rich countries like the United States can do what they like, no matter what the treaties are. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it essentially locks them in. It's now conceded, incidentally, publicly conceded. That the purpose of NAFTA was not to modify trade or anything like that, but it was to lock Mexico into the reforms, make sure they would never get, you know, they'd never be able to extricate themselves from the so-called reforms, which have been a total disaster for the overwhelming majority of Mexicans. Uh, but have led to a very substantial increase in the number of billionaires and have been very good for American investors and so on. So the idea is to lock them in, and the idea behind this treaty is to lock everybody into these arrangements. Well, it's better to do that in secret, and the reasons are sometimes even given. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had an article on Fast Track in which, like the 100 percent of the rest of the press, it was deploring the fact that there's so much opposition to it because they were all in favor of it. In fact, all wealthy sectors have been almost uniformly in favor of it, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, and uh, they said that the problem, the Wall Street Journal pointed out that the problem is, they said that uh, fast track, uh, that the, 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 they said the opponents of fast track, like the labor movement, have an ultimate weapon. Now, what's the ultimate weapon? Well, the ultimate weapon is that the population is opposed to it. Uh, and that's tricky. In fact, that's the problem that Madison was facing when he designed the Constitution. Uh, if you let that ultimate weapon operate, then it might be used to infringe on 
private, unaccountable private power, uh, and that's no good because it might lead to democracy. So we got to watch that. It might lead to democracy and social welfare and relative equality and all those things we try to avoid. Well, that's uh, uh, if you look at other aspects of what's going on, you find exactly the same thing. So I mentioned that the Reaganites were extreme in their uh, violence.